Hey folks, thanks for coming. It's, uh, it's been a great conference so far. I've had a chance to have a few audio conversations with people um, earlier in the day today. I'm, I'm trying to take it easy to, uh, during the week so I don't get too uh, exhausted by the time I have to do my talk, but it's been great to uh, sort of come out of the audio bubble and have some conversations with other audio folks. It's uh, really refreshing. It's a great uh, lead in into my talk today. And so um, to begin, I have uh, a lot of folks that ask me how I do what I do, um, how I manage my time, and how I create music, where does it all come from, and I give them a variety of answers. It's usually that it doesn't grow on trees, and there's actually a very sophisticated process to producing music and time management of uh, the games that I work on. So uh, I thought that I'd do a little talk today about how I manage my time and efforts across both games that I'm developing from the ground up and games that I attend to that are in live service and uh, some of the pipelines that I use to get to that point. So my name is Barry. I am the audio director at EA Fire Monkeys. And uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about are planning, tooling, production and resourcing, time management, and risk mitigation, and uh, how I get through all that sort of stuff uh, in my day-to-day -day work and so forth. So I'm Barry. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background on what I do, um, a lot of folks also ask me how I got into the business and what my path has been. And I always tell them that everybody's path, if you've been in the business for long enough, is quite unique. So I started fairly early. Um, I was an audio engineer at the very beginning. And uh, when I was in college, I wrote uh, a paper on recording studios and how they worked and such and such sort of stuff. And that led me to an internship at a recording studio where uh, I traded my time making coffee for some advertising clients to getting to hang out in the rooms at midnight and learning about these things called tape machines that hung out in the corner and very long consoles with lots of faders and using my ears to uh, listen instead of my eyes and so forth and spent probably seven or eight years recording all sorts of music, learning how to use microphones, dealing with an odd array of personalities in the studio, um, and basically learning from the ground up how to make stuff sound good in an analog environment. And still to this day, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, I've taken those skills uh, into the digital medium and I use that stuff to affect in my day-to-day -day work. So did that for a long time. Some point uh, along the line I was one finger was on the tape machine, the other hand was writing some faders. Somebody was on the other side of the glass. I'm just like, I don't want to do this at 3 o'clock in the morning anymore. I want to be on the other side of the glass creating my own content and doing all that sort of stuff. And so I had an opportunity through some resources that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, who asked me if I would like to join the interactive media team at Microsoft uh, in its early incubation years when we were working on... Uh, PC games, early Xbox, some uh, web-based stuff. And so I said yes, and then spent probably eight or nine years out there doing everything. Um, and that's sound effects, music, voiceover, field recording. Um, they had a big budget, so we were often able to, you know, instead of assembling stuff sort of in a Mickey Mouse way with sound effect libraries, they would fly us all over the country and record you know, vintage aircraft that are no longer in existence and so forth. So it was a really fabulous learning experience. Uh, I got in because uh, they wanted me to record two weeks' worth of voiceover for something they were working on, and, and uh, that lasted for about eight or nine years. Uh, so that was cool. So perseverance um, is a good thing. And uh, having some skills to bring to the table where they knew that I could come in and rewire a patch bay and actually record voiceover and all that sort of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so it led to a fairly long career out there. Um, worked with a lot of folks um, along the way that are still around who I know and regularly talk to. And um, they've all kind of sprawled out to different areas of the industry and have had great success through a variety of different things. So um, that came to an end. It was a great bunch of people. There's probably a half a dozen studios that we worked out of and maybe a dozen audio designers that did all sorts of stuff. Um, I decided at that point that I wanted to do my own thing and started my own business and ran an audio production outsourcing entity for about a decade. Um, and that exposed me to being an out-of-house entity, dealing with a lot of in-house teams, a lot of indie teams, a lot of corporate teams, a lot of everything, 
all across console, PC, Flash, DS, PSP, Palm Pilot, whatever it was, I was able to uh, produce both the music, sound effects, voiceover, integration, and so forth, and all that sort of stuff. So I found myself working on a lot of different stuff simultaneously. I think probably at the peak, I was working on maybe seven or eight games simultaneously, overseeing a small team of people, producing a lot of the content myself, just through attrition, I had to get the gig. You know, like people would say, hey, can you do the sound effect music, voiceover integration? And if I had said, well, I only do one of those, I would have lost the gig, so I learned over time and I'm gonna to get to this with the hat wearing segment of my presentation to say yes to all of it and make sure that I could get it done and so forth. So I did that for quite a while. Uh, and along the way, I was working with some friends that I knew that I had met back in my Microsoft days who were audio folks at EA. And they hired me to work on Peggle and some PVZ Heroes stuff. And those games went on to win a couple of uh, best in audio Mobile Awards, uh, did that for three or four years. An opportunity opened up uh, at EEA to join the team. And in that moment, I said, well, I'm going to not miss doing this eight games at a time thing and focus on one team, one set of tools, one project at a time. And that was very appealing to me because I was getting a little bit burnt on the thing I was doing. So I made the jump. And here I am four and a half years later. And now I do find myself working on multiple titles and so forth. So I'm going to talk about all of this and how I manage all of it. Um, and so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, let me move on to the next slide. All right, so here's how I'm going to define uh, original game development versus live service. So when I say games in development, that's usually when I'm brought in on the ground floor and nothing exists, like maybe a small prototype maybe a map, maybe some character sets, maybe an art style guide, game design doc, all that stuff sort of in the process of build, being built. So I come in um, on the ground floor and I try to begin to set the design vision where it hasn't been set before. So I'll look at all the art, the game design stuff, and try and begin a plan uh, from the audio, from my audio standpoint as to what's, uh, what's happening. No content's been built, uh, generally either visually or on the audio side. Uh, so I will have to start prototyping sort of some stuff. And the tools and tech uh, need to be determined still, need to be determined still. So what's the engine we're using? What's the middleware? Can we port everything from previous projects or stuff that's already in existence? And what are the tools I'm gonna need to help with the audio integration? And by contrast, live service I found already has established games. Um, they have regular content updates the gameplay mechanics and the general um, design aesthetic is already in place, so I don't have to figure that out on myself. Um, sometimes I work on games that I have worked on previously, so it's a very easy transition into the live service because I would have built the core game uh, by itself, and then it's a very easy transition to continue on with the live service. Oftentimes I get dropped into the fire where I don't know anything about the previous project or where it came from or how it was put together and I have to really look into the past to see the logic of what was done on the audio side to continue it forward. And that's one of the difficulties with the live service stuff uh, in a different way for, than doing stuff from the ground up where I can set the vision. Like I don't always know what the original vision was. I can only look to what's in the game uh, and try and move it forward as best I can. And then uh, generally there's already style guides that have been established, art style guides, and something that can give me a general vibe for, for what to do with the content going forward and so forth. And then obviously the game has full content integration, so sound, audio, visual, animations, the whole nine yards is already in there and uh, is a feature set that I can rely on and a palette of audio that I can either build from or try and take in a new direction and so forth. Okay, so planning. Um, I'm not sure how many folks do stuff, um, are involved with original IP and building stuff from the ground up versus the live service cadence and so forth, but uh, when I begin in the, the, the planning cycle, I usually have to set the direction early on. Um, and the direction is set early on so that I can make specific asks in terms of engineering support, UI support and budgeting so that I know that down the line when we have milestone deliverables that come due, then I am in step with what is required to successfully get the milestone out the door. So a lot of what I do in the beginning is defining the genre of the game, 
what the gameplay mechanics are going to be and the overall vision for the game. And then I create the style guide. And the idea style guide is often based on the visual style guide. And I get a lot of inspiration from looking at what the art aesthetic is going to be in the game. Like if we already know what the genre is, I can look at something. What's the town map going to look like? What are the characters, the bosses? What's the UI going to be? Um, stylistically, what needs to happen there? And I can get a lot of inspiration from that. And then I build my own style guide. And it's a way for me to basically blueprint what I want to do with the game. I know um, the music system needs to be built. What type of music are we going to need to fulfill the music system? What kind of characters are in the game? What sort of supporting content and assets are needed to um, get that stuff out the door and so forth? So I'll set like the creative side, and I'll also answer the questions as to what are we doing, why are we doing it, and how are we doing it? Because I think that answers a lot of questions when I have to give presentations to folks and they want to know, well, we're going to spend this money on this, why are we doing that? And I like to have a very succinct answer as to it adds stickiness to the game, it's going to create player immersion, it helps with daily retention. There's a lot of stuff in my belief on the mobile side that can be done with audio to help with the general uh, user experience in a positive way. Like I want mobile audio to enhance it and not detract from it. So I'll answer those questions and present it to the team in a way that hopefully makes sense to them. And sometimes it's difficult because they don't, they don't understand necessarily um, all the fine minutia that goes into doing this sort of stuff, but it's a good way to have a formal guide so that anybody wants to look at it, they have a blueprint for what my plans are for the game, and it also establishes a blueprint for me to work from down the line when I'm, you know, stuff's changing all the time and I'm not entirely sure, like, if the direction is going to shift or not, I have this thing to refer back to and so forth. Uh, and it's also a great way um, to identify the engineering needs early on since um, generally the systems haven't been built yet. So if there is a music system that I know is going to be something other than just looping music throughout the game, I'm going to have to have an engineering ask and then figure out what the tie-in is between the game engine and the middleware, get the engineering support for it so that I know down the road I can start building towards it uh, and build a better game that's based on in my, you know, interactive music as opposed to just stuff that's living in the background, which is a little bit more of an engineering ask. Um, I look at comps, I listen to stuff. Um, I do a lot of running, so I go out and listen to stuff when I'm running just to see what's out there and what might be appropriate for the game. Um, I would say that I listen to other games, I listen to TV and film media for inspiration. Um, I was asked once to, when I was doing the, more of the freelance stuff, I was asked um, to write some music for a game. And they said, we want a cross between Cloverfield and Pacific Rim. And so what I did was I listened to those as comps, and I realized that it's eight bars of this, and then it's two bars of a percussion interlude, and it direct modulates up a minor third, and repeat, repeat, repeat. So that was a good example of like, the client sending me comps and me being able to deduce what was happening there and prepare something for them uh, that ended up being on target as to what they were looking for. So oftentimes I will work into the style guide what specific stuff I need and then I go even further and create documents that identify what about the music is appropriate for the game. What is it doing stylistically? What's the instrumentation? What's the harmonic melodic content? Um, and so forth and so on. So. Again, that's always a good blueprint, and it's also a good communication device for people asking you, like, what are we going to do with the music, or what are we going to do with the sound design, and so forth. I can point them to the document, and they have all the information they need. And again, it's a way for me to, to dive back into it and so forth. Uh, resourcing, again, like, it's, it's good to plan early on, like, what the technical and the resourcing needs are. If we know that the timeline is going to be two or three years, I might not need to hire as many people as if we were doing a large amount of stuff in a very short amount of time. So um, typically I will look to, um, in my planning phase, look to what the rest of the team is doing and then decide how much help, if any, I'm going to need and then start planning on budgetary, uh, see what our budgetary constraints are and looking at the timeline to see when I might need to bring in help or what other resourcing? Do we need to go out and do field recording? Do we need to hire a live orchestra? What are we going to do? And uh, through the planning process, I can identify a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, 
So the live service, by, contact, by contrast, the game already exists. So um, because the scale is so much smaller, um, it's a lot easier for me to just look at the game, talk to the DDs and the PMs about what the features are and when they're going to be required, and then what is required on the audio side to fulfill those uh, feature uh, releases and so forth. So I'll spend some time identifying that, and oftentimes the cadence is pretty regular. Um, I don't know if any of you folks are in the agile development process, but it's very easy to uh, plot against sprints and release dates, known feature content that is the same set down the line, you know, every six or 10 or 12 weeks and so forth. So that in itself is a lot easier because I can predict exactly what needs to happen and what kind of con is need, you know, content is needed for it and so forth. Um, any dependencies, like generally the tools already exist, so I don't have any dependencies on engineering creating new tools. Don't have a lot of asks there. I either have already worked with it, or I evangelize for upgrading to it, or it's a mystery tool that I have to go back in time and figure out like how it all works and so forth, which is sometimes not, not easy. Um, but I've been doing it a long time, and I've seen a lot of stuff, so I can generally just use my intuition to figure it out and so forth. Um, and that's uh, with the tool set. The known and the unknown. What is known? Like, are we using Wiser FMOD or nothing at all? Uh, that's always a good question to ask, and it's easy if you've worked in those particular pieces of middleware um, to get around them if you spend some time on them. Um, the unknown are more proprietary tools that I haven't worked with before. Um, sometimes I will have, sometimes, again, I get dropped into stuff and I don't know what I'm getting into. I just need to know, like, how to fire events and, and so forth. And um, Generally, I think these days it's a little bit easier because um, when I was doing my own thing, a lot of times I would uh, be asked to write a lot of music and do a lot of sound design and so forth and then throw it over the fence. And I never knew how it was getting integrated and it was always, you know, we have don't have a lot of time to do this. And I just it scared me because I was pretty sure it wasn't being done correctly and, and not as uh, eloquently as I can do it now with the tools that we have and so forth. So in terms of tooling, um, when we're building stuff from the ground up, the first thing I'll do is look to see what's been used in the past. Like, are there other games in development or ha that have been in development or are currently in live service that we can poach the middleware from? Um, or some of the existing tools if it's pr proprietary engine. Um, can they be shared from other projects? Um, generally, if they can, I'll evangelize for that because it's just less work for me. Um, a lot of times it's either Wise or FMOD as the, as the middleware, which is nice because I've got time on both and it just makes it easier for the engineers who have to get it all set up and for myself who has to use it in the end uh, to get going. Uh, and I also look to see what can be improved upon. A lot of times there's tools that were built really quickly early on and then because of timing considerations and budget and so forth, they sort of frozen in time and calcified. So if there is a way to be for me to improve upon them, I will also look to evangelize for that. Like maybe the tool doesn't allow you to monitor audio through it. If we can build that functionality in, that's always nice and so forth. Uh, and then again, like is there a knowledge base for the Indian tools? Like a lot of times this stuff's built and folks leave or for whatever the reasons, there's no, there's no um, documentation. So uh, I look around to see if any of it exists, if it's something that I haven't worked on before or if I'm building it from the ground up, I try and uh, um, document it in real time for myself and for any onboarding that I have to do with folks that are new to the project. Um, and then of course, uh, if stuff needs to be built, I'll have those conversations early on. Like, we all know if a music system, ambient system needs to be built, then it's going to require a certain subset of events being fired. Are we going to do layers? Are we going to do just looping stuff? How's it going to work? How's it going to crossfade? All that stuff I try and identify early on in the style guide so that I can have a uh, viable presentation for the engineering team uh, to build that sort of stuff out. Uh, and then what systems are going to need? Uh, are we going to need to support the gameplay? If there's a narrative thing, maybe that uh, means that we have to build a system that supports the narrative or character sets. Um, it's kind of cool watching the FMOD presentation the other day because I realized, like, you know, sometimes it really is as simple as, like, when you're placing events on a timeline or scrubbing an animation timeline, you need a way to place those events. Does that functionality exist, or do we need to build it from the ground up, or is it part of the, um, part of the uh, engine that we're... Uh, working with. So I try and identify all of that sort of stuff and then make a case for it to get those tools in early, uh, as early as I can, because I cannot do what I need to do without that functionality in place early on. So 
I'll look for it and document it and get it out to the engineers as uh, early as I can, which is requesting support early and often, as much as I can and all the time. I know it irritates people, but they need to hear it because audio is often less left um, to the end of the line. And if it's not, if the technical components aren't set up early, it makes it very difficult to create the final content without that base in, uh, in, in, in early. So uh, on the live service side, the tooling uh, has normally already been established, so I'll look to see if there's stuff that I can do to make it better or if it's actually a hindrance. And um, one of the things I've done recently is I've done an upgrade in the middleware, which took something that didn't um, had no support for and was on its last legs. Uh, and it was actually kind of a hindrance to the project because it was in a place where it could fail at any time and there was no known fix for it other than doing a massive overhaul and upgrade, which we were able to discuss successfully do. And that brought us to the point of where we have stability on the middleware side, and we also have this new way of doing really neat and interesting things um, that's 10 years later than when the original stuff went in. And so that's been a real nice boon for me because I can now do interactive audio in the way that I would like to um, and do some neat things to get the live service stuff moving forward into the next generation and so forth. Uh, production resourcing. So, um, Obviously, if you're building something from the ground up, you're starting from scratch. Um, the resourcing that I do always depends on the scope of the audio vision. And I try, like I spend most of my time in the mobile space right now, I try really to bring um, HD audio to the mobile space. Like I play games and a lot of times there just isn't any sound in the game and so forth. So I try and bring a pretty high quality bar to everything I do on the mobile side. And a lot of that depends on what the scope is and what the vision is, what the budget is, what the timeline is. All of those factors sort of blend together into um, setting a production pipeline and resourcing for it in a way that gets me to these milestone releases on time and on target and so forth. And so the, how many hats do you wear? It's like probably one of the questions I get asked all the time, and I'll be continuing. It's a discussion you probably have all had for a long, long, long time and so forth, and I tend to wear all of them. Um, I've done a lot of all of them. Um, I have all my formal training is in music and so forth, so I spend a, a lot of time writing music and knowing how to communicate such things to external entities if I need to use them. But I find that because I've had to touch a lot of stuff, um, there is always a time where I'm asked to do stuff with, with a, in a very short time span. So we need music, we need sound effects, we need voiceover, we need integration. I need to know how to do that, and I also need to know how to do it so that I can direct somebody else to do it in a meaningful way. So I tend to, in a meaningful way. So I tend to wear a, a lot of hats all the time. Um, it's something I like doing. I've tried doing one or the other very specifically. I would say I've spent most of the last 10 years doing music and so forth, but. Um, there also comes a time where, you know, as an external entity, you have very busy times and you have very busy, uh, very unbusy times, and I prefer the busy part of it. And I find that having um, knowledge of how to get through each of the disciplines at a fairly high level has been a really good um, skill set for me to have over the years. And I still find now, like when we accordion up for a project and accordion down, there's a lot of stuff that comes back to me and I have to know how to do it. Um, and so. Again, like, I've been doing it long enough and I find that I just end up wearing a lot of hats despite my best intents to sometimes not do that. Um, it, it, always, it always comes back to me uh, there. So I look out when I'm planning for production resourcing, I will try to determine um, what I'm gonna need help with and how we're gonna get there and so forth and then uh, plan accordingly. accordingly. Um, And so the, the relationship pipelines, those are something that I really find to be very important. It's oftentimes pretty easy to forget that they exist. And what I mean by the relationship pipelines are all the things that I know I'm gonna need. If I have to wear multiple hats, I have to operate very quickly and efficiently. So for instance, I need to know that if I need to outsource, who am I outsourcing to? 
and are they available, and can they handle the stuff that I'm, that I'm sending them. I prefer to outsource to folks that I know and have worked with in the past because I know and trust that what they're gonna deliver me, deliver to me is gonna be on time and target. Um, I also need to speak the language with folks. So, you know, for instance, somewhat recently I was setting up an orchestral recording session and I need, and there's, if any of you have done it, there's a lot of moving parts to it with contracting the orchestra, um, the orchestrators, the conductors, um, the players, and all that sort of stuff, getting the legal documents in place to get everything um, moving along. And so, once again, going back to the how many hats do I wear, I have to be able to communicate what I need to these folks. But before I get to that, I need to make sure that these folks are available. Like, do they have time to do it? COVID was tough because in terms of live recording, for instance, one of the studios I use, violin players had to be sit seated 10 feet apart. They can't vibe on each other with their bowing, even though it's marked in the music. So that was an issue. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to go forward with the recording because that would have changed the way I'm normally used to hearing players play in that setting. And so that was an odd thing. Um, and so I made sure that I was in communication with the engineer and the contractors to make sure that we were sort of staying on pace uh, with what needed to happen. And um, legal people, on the other hand, too, I need to sometimes uh, deal with contracting agencies and voiceover agencies and talent agencies and all that sort of stuff. So oftentimes there's work for hire agreements, there's NDAs, there's uh, financial stuff that needs to happen, and I need to make sure that that stuff's all in place. So with one email, I can say I need to hire these people and need this talent release. I know that in one email it's ready to go and I'm not having to reinvent the wheel by figuring out who the legal people are, what the process is. So I spend a lot of time just talking to people, making sure you know, that the studio hasn't closed or these people are even in the business to make sure that when I need to go and we need to move quickly through the production and resourcing, that those folks are ready to go. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the accordion effect, ramping up and ramping down through the projects. Um, it's nice to have a team of folks to work with when things get busy. Um, but one of the things that I'm always a little bit leery of is that if I delegate too much, if I give ownership in its entirety to somebody and we're on a contract basis, if they come out early or the contract ends, all that stuff comes boomeranging back onto me and I need to know how to do it. So once again, I'm wearing multiple hats to make sure that whatever this discipline was doing, I know how to do because it's gonna come right back to me. Um, and, and so it's always, um, I try not to be too hovery as a manager, um, but I also need to pay attention to what my direct reports are doing and so forth because, again, like when we ramp up, at some point we have to ramp down and sometimes that lost knowledge can come back to me and I don't like having to dig back and figure out what was happening. I like to make sure that I was in on it just enough to know that I can address it if it comes back around and I need to um, pivot. Budgetary considerations, how much money do we have? Does that support what I wanna do? Um, are we gonna go out and record stuff? Can we afford live musicians on the music? Um, there's a lot of work that goes into that, just figuring out what the budget can be. And a lot of times we don't know that until later on down the line because we don't know how, much, how many minutes of music we're gonna need, what style of music we're gonna need. Can we get away with sound effects libraries versus doing live recording, field recording and so forth. So I'll spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure these things out and figure out where they lie on the budgetary timeline. Um, Life service is a lot easier because you're working from an established roadmap. Um, one of the things I do, like if I'm busy doing stuff um, from the ground up, on the live service stuff, it really helps to have um, efficiencies in the content production. So there's oftentimes um, a pool of content that I can bring forward from the games that are currently in live service. A lot of times that stuff can be um, uh, can be built, like I spend a lot of time just building out like sound assets that I know I use all the time and I know that I can share in between projects. So I will look for efficiencies there and see if I can, if I have the stuff that's available for me, it just makes getting the, um, the, fu the future feature updates done in a really quick and timely manner. And then I don't have dependencies on other folks to do it either, I can do it myself. I know how to do it, I can do it quickly, all the assets that I need are there in working from. So um, I also will oftentimes look to what's in the game and do takedowns. So um, for instance, 
what's the instrumentation of the music? It's you know pizzicato strings, woodwinds, harp, percussion, or whatever. Once I know what that palette is, then I can move forward creating new music with exactly that palette. And oftentimes I'll go in and go deeper and determine what the beat per minute is, what's the tonal center, what is it doing that I can replicate on my end in, uh, in a similar fashion to uh, have all of the new content that's needed sound like the old content and make that transition fairly seamless. So I do do a bit of pre-production when I get into a new live service project that I haven't worked on previous, previously. I'll spend a lot of time just mapping out some more of the musical details on that. Uh, sound design is the same type of thing, like what, what um, elements are being used that create this particular palette of sounds, and sometimes it's fairly easy if it's a known object. Um, if it's more customized sound design, stylized, stylistic stuff, I'll listen and try and replicate it as best I can and then know that I have an onboard um, a library of assets specific to that game that I can use to move forward and it cuts my production time down by probably 50% and so forth. Um, reuse and sharing, obviously, if there's stuff that can be reused, um, I'll try and do that. Footsteps, explosions, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, a lot of times it can just be reused, so sometimes the feature work for an oncoming feature, I don't have to do anything because the content's there, I just hook it up and it's done and out the door. Um, outsourcing, um, sometimes I find that outsourcing, I can do it in more quickly than if I outsource. Once again, on the many hats, you know, like I don't, it's like getting to outsourcing sometimes is a, it's a process of getting the legal stuff in place. It's a process of putting together a style guide for them so they know what to do. It's a process of reviewing the work and having them iterate on it and getting through the financial stuff and getting through ASCAP and BMI if they want. Uh, can they get credits and all this sort of stuff? So I will oftentimes just do it myself because it's quicker, faster, and so forth. Um, if it's a large chunk of work and I know the people um, that I'm going to be working with, then it can be an enormous help because I know and I trust I can get this segment of defined work out to them. They produce it, bring it back to me, and then I get it in the game and so forth. So um, it goes both ways. I've seen folks, too, um, a lot of people lose time on just having to go through the iteration process. And sometimes it's, um, it's unfortunate because, you know, there's a lot of time needlessly spent going over and over and over and over getting this stuff back in the door when it could have been done easily by the person who's overseen it in the first place. Uh, okay. Doing pretty good on time. Um, so time management. Um, how do I manage my time across the two development environments? It's difficult. Uh, I got up this morning. I had five meetings that all started at the same time. And I'm like, I gotta be at GCAP in 15 minutes. Which one should I go to? And I end up going to none of them because I had to be here. But uh, oftentimes, uh, I have to pick and choose um, what I'm focused on in that moment, uh, and then go to that meeting. But I also um, take a look at what is the most important thing I should be working on in that moment. And then I set my personal schedule, and I usually design very long roadmaps where I can see what the milestones are for the original stuff in development, when the real production timeline is gonna begin, when soft launch and worldwide is going to occur, and then what the live service uh, feature complete dates are along the way. I can very quickly see if there's going to be a spike in production where I'm gonna to need to potentially hire, and I can also see if there's dates that clash and work back from those dates. And uh, if anybody uses Asana, that's a great timeline to use because I can map it all out and see it in an instant and so forth. Uh, and then I try and load balance as best I can. And again, like this, this wearing, doing, spending time uh, wearing multiple hats, doing a different audio disciplines, like it's just a lifesaver in so many ways because I know like there's times when I can just get it done and do it at a very high level and get it out the door and sort of bypass the, the hiring outsourcing thing. And then there's other times where I can use those skills to work with my direct reports, level them up, get them inspired, speak the same language. Like I want to be able to tell them exactly what to do and demonstrate it, even if I'm not the best person to be doing it, because it's just exciting. They get excited and they get inspired and then they go from there and, and do, do what they need to do. Um, Meetings, too many meetings, obviously. I don't have a solution for that. I just put it in there because everybody knows there's a lot of meetings and so forth. So generally, um, I do go to a lot of meetings. I have a lot of FOMO about meetings because I'm worried that I'll miss like critical data that doesn't get disseminated to me through the normal pipelines. Um, so I do go and I collect data on that sort of stuff. 
Um, I mentioned that I, I do do long range roadmaps. I think it's really valuable, like I'll span six months to a year to two years and collect all the data between projects and get those all onto a map that I can see um, uh, and uh, schedule my time and all and the resources that I need alongside them as well. Um, outsourcing and delegation, I kind of talked about that already. Um, I love to delegate, I love to let people take ownership of stuff, but in the end, because I'm responsible, inevitably kind of comes back to me, so I don't always let the leash go all the way. I always kind of like make sure that I know what, um, what this person is doing so that I can come back to it if I need to down the road. Um, agile development environment is primarily what I work in, uh, and we have Jira tasking and milestone deliverables and sprint dates and all that sort of stuff, and that provides a lot of accountability and visibility for the teams that I work with. So they know what I'm doing, they know when it's going to be delivered, they can do their burn down charts and see that audio is sticking out or it's on time. Uh, and it's a great place for me to sort of very succinctly in an organized and accountable way get what I do out to the broader team so that there's accountability for it. Okay, and then the last slide is uh, about risk uh, mitigation. How can we arrive at our milestones deliverables successfully? As I mentioned, I ask for support early and often. Um, I pr prioritize stuff that I know I'm going to need help with. Um, oftentimes it's engineering support. Oftentimes it's UI support. I spend a lot of time like figuring out how UI sounds are going to be integrated, whether I'm doing it or if there's a tool that can do it or if the UI team is going to do it themselves and so forth. I'd look, I spend a lot of time like surveying the horizon. Um, I go running in the morning and I listen to music because I listen to music, but I also like scan the horizon to see what storm is brewing. And, you know, potentially there could be a, you know, weather dynamic that somebody integrated into the map that I need to know about and they didn't tell me. So I spend a lot of time like looking out to see what could potentially be a problem what's a red flag and then I ask about it or I raise visibility about it or I figure out how it's going to affect me down the road. And that's generally a practice that I use every day and it's really been of benefit to help sidestep any trouble and then um, evangelize for support and raise visibility to the team um, if it's something that's gonna affect stuff. Um, I mentioned I collect data. I like I scan all the discipline channels that aren't audio because inevitably like Somebody will mention something in passing. It's like, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna do this thing, and okay, and I'm like, what is? Wait, wait a minute, what? Back up here, man. What is this thing? And then oftentimes will be some feature that I need to, you know, that's more than, it's more than something that can just be dealt with in a passing conversation. It's something that really needs to be refined, and it's an audio feature within itself that I need to deal with. So, it's really amazing how much time I spend listening to what other people are talking about, even if it's an unrelated meeting that I need to be in. There's a lot of data that can be collected from that, and I just, I listen, I listen, I listen, and every meeting that I'm in, there's always some little nugget I take away that, that has an effect on what I need to do, and then I'll oftentimes blow it up into more of an issue if it's something that's going to that's gonna take time or be relevant to what I'm working on. Um, I try to keep the scope within available resources. So if there's a change in direction or if there's reliance on outsourcing that's going to increase the flow of assets back in that I need to deal with, I will raise those concerns early as I can and as often as I can. And I also try to, if I'm gonna to commit to something, I commit to only my deliverables within a milestone. I try not to work beyond that or below it. I just make sure that I deliver what I'm trying to do on time so that the people who are managing the project know it's gonna be there and they've had visibility into when it's coming and how it's coming in and any dependencies um, that are gonna affect the rest of the team like engineering support. Um, and that's basically defining the specific milestone requirements and working towards them. And then lastly, keeping your resources warm. You know, as I mentioned, like I have um, a lot of resources uh, physically um, around me, studios, agencies, um, uh, film and media recording orchestra, musicians, all that sort of stuff. And I try to spend some time making sure periodically I check in with them, say, how's it going? Um, how's it been? through COVID because a lot of places just didn't make it. Like I have several studios that have shut down uh, in my area, just, just couldn't make it work and so forth. So then I have to shift and shifting means I have to know a new engineer, I have to know the new space, I have to get the legal stuff in place that allows me to actually um, 
uh, interact with them and so forth. And that in itself is a big process that I don't want to be dealing with when I'm trying to get and plan for and produce content in a very, uh, with a very tight timelines. So I'll just take the time to call friends who I've hired in the past to uh, studios, all the stuff that I just mentioned and so forth, to make sure that they're still open for business and so forth. Uh, that's it. Um, I think that's it. Yes, yeah, so I want to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions and answers because we're at the 45 minute mark. Felt like five minutes going by. So, yeah, thanks for listening. It's been fun. Thanks for coming. <laughs>
Uh, hello. Hey, Barry. Um, I'm Andrew. Thanks for hello the there. talk. Yeah, very no problem. Thanks for coming. Um, no problems. Uh, just a very general question. Um, how much support from slash interaction with international EA do you have? Or are you, are you kind of out here on your own or you interact with them a lot? I am in a, a um, distributed working environment. So I am based in America, in Seattle right now. Oh, cool. And so we have a facility there. And Fire Monkeys has a facility here, so I come visit. And we work through all the remote connection stuff that we're used to working in now. And I can pull giant builds down, and I can meet with people. I meet. Sometimes I'll go into two Zoom meetings at once and then just mute one or the other because I have to be there both times. But it works, you know? And, um, and so it's... The time difference isn't isn't bad at all, and I'm just able to like everybody's working remotely, and I just at first it was weird because it's like I got to get all my stuff when we went under the lockdown. I've got work stuff, I've got personal stuff, and how it's all combined. And I found that because we're all doing the remote thing now, it's like it's just one big happy bunch of people all working remotely and so forth. And it's been it's been really nice. It's been really nice to be down here too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I think yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It might be a quick question. Just okay. handling music composition under an agile framework. Yes. Do you find it's better to do like big sweeping tasks that cover the whole song or being more oh, granular? No, that's an excellent question. So what I do, like most of the stuff I do ends up using an orchestral palette. And I, um, I start with black and white sketches. I start with three line piano sketches. Like that's what I do. I map the music out. So, so with the Agile development, I will do the sketch, the orchestration, and then the final mix and break those into separate tasks, and I'll do it per cue. So I'll say, like, this week I'm going to write, I'm going to do the sketching for three cues. I know, that it takes, I know how long it takes me to do that, and I know um, how much in terms of story points or whatever you can put into a particular sprint. So and I've tried to do it all at once, and I just find, like, I go long and I don't get it done on time. So... Like today, I'm going to only write the music and chart it out. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to do the orchestration on it, and I will. St I write straight into Finale, export a MIDI file out, and then I have my like a traditional orchestral setup in Pro Tools that I will then do the mock-up. So I'll s use that as a separate task in addition to the music writing, and then I'll have a whole other task uh, that deals with mixing it and the final production on it. And then if it goes onto a live ensemble, that's a whole other thing that that has a bunch of subtasking and so forth. So I, I do try and break it down. And I do spend a lot of time making sure that like I don't flounder writing music if I, I don't do the, the writer's block thing anymore. Like I've done it for so long that I just work right through that stuff. And if I have to do two or three minutes, I just work straight into it and know that I can get it done. And again, it's like, it just, it comes from having to get stuff done. Like when I was financially bound to it through contracting work I was doing, like I couldn't go long or I wouldn't get paid, so I just made sure I got it done. And now I've done it enough that I know exactly how much I can do in a given amount of time, for sure. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. I, they say time's up, so it felt like five minutes went by, so thanks everybody. All right. Thank you for coming. Oh, yeah, if anybody, if you have any more questions, just come, come up and hang out or uh, come to the Fire Monkeys booth. All right.